Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 100 Year Real Estate Investor. We're your host, Jake and Gino, and this is the show dedicated to long term personal financial engineering. Gino, how's it going? Doing good, Jake. How you doing today, brother? Always making it happen, big man. Today's guest is chief economist and head of industry principals for RealPage. His deep insights on market trends and consumer behaviors have been cited in the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and New York Times. So without further ado, Jay Parsons, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. It is our pleasure. Let's get to know each other a little bit. Uh, I just want to hear a little bit about your background and how you got started in business. Yeah, so I have I started off at, uh, in, at RealPage uh, 14 years ago now doing as a market researcher and Frankly, uh, like most of all, multifamily had no intention of staying around very long, but got stuck into it, fell in love with it. And, you know, I always tell people all the time, you know, I don't think anybody ever grew up and got to go into college thinking, hey, I'd love to be in the rental housing industry. But, um, you know, once you get in there, you, you, you kind of are in there forever. So now I'm a lifer, but uh, now I have the opportunity to uh, head up our economics team here at RealPage. What I would tell all the listeners to do is the first thing is to go to LinkedIn and type in Jay Parsons and start following all of Jay's blogs and articles that he writes because they're really thoughtful they're insightful they're actually an economist that seems as if he's doing the business he's not a guru it sounds as if he's a guru he's out there actually doing it and he's got a pulse and, and when you read stuff that he wrote six months ago it actually comes to fruition whereas most economists out there seem like they're just throwing stuff on the wall and going oh well things change inflation is transitory blah 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 Jay, you know, I, buy I, svb right <laughs> exactly yeah. in my exact point in, the, in four weeks later you know, $40 billion, bye-bye. Jay, oh. what keeps you up right now? What worries you about the real estate market in general? Or maybe let's go into multifamily. What are the things that you're looking for in multifamily that scare you right now? Wow, okay, that's a good question. I think, well, scare is a strong word, but I think what, what definitely concerns, uh, is most concerning is just the rapid rise in interest rates. It's a real game changer. You know, I was uh, tell people, you know, kind of the key thing right now is everyone's worried about rental housing. There's been some really negative headlines. Just this week, there's one in the Wall Street Journal about this. But I, a lot of it's just misunderstood. It's not that, you know, if you look back at what was underwritten these past few years, it's not that everyone's missing on revenue expectations. I mean, nobody expected to maintain 10 plus percent rent growth. What's I thought really, it was 20. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the issue is really the expense side. You know, if you did write 3% expense growth into perpetuity, you know, that, that's more challenging. There's inflation, but particularly those who are on, uh, you know, short-term floating rate debt, you know, you come up to maturity, Later this year, next year, rates are substantially higher than even kind of your worst case scenario. That's a game changer for especially these short term value add investors. And I think that's going to create some some challenges, not for the entire market, but there's going to be some pockets of distress for sure. And is that the opportunity then? Is that what is the yes. opportunity on the flip side? Now, we're a little scared. We're not really yep. the word scared is maybe a little too harsh, but worried, concerned, where's the opportunity then that you see? Well, there's going to be opportunity. I think there's two different uh, opportunities. You know, one is going to be, you know, traditional acquisition for these kind of forced sale situations. Uh, and I think there's a lot of capital out there that's patiently waiting for that. You know, they, uh, apartment sales have evaporated of late, but it's not because investors don't want it. It's because right now, you know, the cap rates have not come up to the degree needed for these deals to pencil out. Now, that could change later this year as we start to see some of the potential distress. And the second opportunity, I think, is going to be, you know, we're seeing some emerging distressed capital funds, rescue capital funds. So they're looking at uh, preferred equity and, and, and MES debt. So, you know, kind of inserting into the capital stack to add equity to these deals that all of a sudden – uh, can't cover their debt service. I love the articles that you've written on uh, rent control, market rate, and even this DeSantis affordable housing bill. Can you break that down, that misnomer that, hey, rent control really works, and this is a way to actually take control of rents and bring rents down? Yeah, no, it's 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 interesting. The, 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 there's been so much academic research on rent control, and what a lot of people you know really need to realize is, like, this is settled science. Like, it's not it's not something that's up for debate. And, you know, you see a lot of the coverage in this topic is sort of like, here's one side, here's the other. But I really liken it to, it's it's kind of like when we looked at, you know, what happened during during COVID and, and there was a big pushback, the idea was two-side debate to really get into what settled science. And I would say, I'm not a scientist, so I don't want to get into that. But I think that same standard has to apply here. Like, it's settled science, you know. There's been studies by uh, by Harvard and, and, and economists from Stanford, MIT, that have all shown that it does more harm than good to affordability. It leads to ultimately lesser supply, which puts upward pressure on pricing. You're creating discounted rents, mostly for those who don't necessarily need it because there's no income qualification for it, which means that you're squeezing out lower income households who no longer could find available housing. And really it only benefits those who are in place 
at the time rent control is passed, and then they're able to, uh, you know, obviously maintain much discounted re rental housing at the expense of everything coming in later, and everyone who comes later is going to pay a lot more. It takes away so property rights, though, too. Like, I, I, don't, I never feel like I hear anyone talking about the property rights side of things. You know, it, it's basically yeah. discounting property rights of the, the landlord, which it's, I have a problem with. Yeah, so. and, you know, unfortunately, the courts have, have allowed that going back decades. I mean, this started after World War II in New York, and uh, it's persisted since then. Um, but, you know, that, that's certainly a real challenge. And, and it's one reason why, you know, that we've seen uh, part of the issue, too, is, is, is in rent-controlled markets, the owners of the buildings are incentivized to take them out of the market, turn them into condos or office buildings, or just sell them all together. So, you know, it, it's, 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 again, ultimately a counterproductive policy. There's there's a piggyback to this as well. I saw an article that came out, I don't know, it was a month or two ago, and uh, it was talking about uh, RealPage's Yieldstar. And basically you had, you had Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, if I remember correctly, sort of uh, attacking it. But if I take a step back, and for folks, and you can probably describe it better than me, but essentially Yieldstar is AI that helps to set the market rate pricing for uh, an apartment in, 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 the, in, in the given you know area. And to me, that is the the closest thing to fair housing, which is a, a basically government code that comes in and you know wants to level the playing field, make sure there's no discrimination, and ultimately that allows the marketplace to determine what the the price should be with taking all the other factors out of it. So I don't know if you have any comment on that, but I, I found that kind of interesting as well. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm not able to comment on that stuff since obviously there's sure there's, there's I figured as going much, on but, there. I have to defer yeah. those things. But I will tell you, at the, at the end of the day, what happened these last few years is they're just, you know, we had the lowest vacancy that we've seen in three decades of track in the market. Yeah. And when you look at policies like rent control, it's just exacerbating that problem where there's just not enough housing. And ultimately, you know, the best, in, in fact, uh, uh, I believe it was the mayor of New York a couple months ago, a couple weeks ago, he tweeted this out. He said, hey, uh, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, if we want more, if, if we want to, to reduce the pressure on pricing, let's build more housing. And that's absolutely the right thing. Like if the best way to reduce upward pressure on, on rents or even home prices is to build a lot more of it, just build it. But unfortunately, a lot of cities are getting in their own way of making it way too hard and way too expensive. And it's getting, it's getting very expensive and it's getting very time consuming. And, and a lot of the, the things that uh, cities are saying they're for, their actions do not align once you get oh, into yeah. the process. And that's, I think that's the real rub there. Yeah, yeah no, it's funny because everybody wants, you know, so look at cities across the country. Everybody talks about, hey, we need affordable housing. But at the same time, they are spending, you know, multiple meetings debating what the veneer, brick and stone veneer should be on these buildings that's driving up the rent, what the setback should be, how much parking, all of these things they're trying to do to make them, uh, you know, more palatable for their aesthetic tastes and preferences and make it more palatable for the neighbors across the street. All of these things just well, make stay on the neighbors for a second, because that is be basically becoming the NIMBY pitchfork mafia. And yeah. they, everyone wants to cry discrimination these days about everything. What about the, the property owners who have the zoning in place and then they're applying to get their permits, but the pitchfork mafia comes out that lives down the road and says, you can't do this. Well, the real discrimination lies there because 20 years ago, they were able to build their property and enjoy yep. it. But now you own your property and they're trying to tell you what to do with it and, and dictate things. So there's, there's a lot of issues going on affecting this. And I don't think anyone has any idea about it. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think a lot of it has to do is like there's a strong anti-renter sentiment across this country. You know, our country, both from a policy perspective nationally and how we favor homeowners, but also from, you know, you see this local that we referred to is everyone's say everyone, there, there's a there's there's a strong anti-renter sentiment. People think that, hey, if we allow apartments into our neighborhood, it's going to flood our kids with our, our schools with more kids. It's going to it's going to increase traffic. It's an increased crime. All of these things are absolute. But there's myth. a homelessness issue, and like it's like everything's a, con a constant contradiction. So at some point, yeah. you, you just tend to get fed up with this crap. Yeah, so. but we're allowing these myths to persist, persist, and um, unfortunately, you know, it's it's very counterproductive again to the cause of just adding more housing. Yeah. Can you talk about the DeSantis's bill, as affordable housing bill? It's a seven hundred million dollar bill with bipartisan support. Can you discuss that bill a little bit? And what it what it does? Yeah. No. It's a it's it's a great bill. Thankfully, it passed with bipartisan support. Um, it was signed by the governor, as you noted. Um, and I hope it becomes a model uh, across the country. I mean, it's really something that gives something to everybody in this regard. Where uh, number one is there's incentives for developers to build more affordable housing. 
Um, you know, one of the things, just real briefly, I could talk about this for days. Define but, affordable in the, in this sense. I'm just curious because yeah. I'm not familiar with the bill. So th there's affordable and there's workforce housing. Whenever you hear those terms, what they're really trying to define is what the rent level should be relative to the area median income. And so affordable could be, you know, something like 50 to 60 percent of the median for that area and ultimately workforce usually. But like not 80. subsidized. Well, it, it's subsidized to the owner in the sense that they're getting tax subsidies in exchange gotcha. for being able to guarantee that rents will be at these levels. You it. can't build to those rent levels without those subsidies in place. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's the real rub here is if you want to build apartments, you're really building to upper income six figure renters. I mean, the like, I mean, here's a crazy stat. I don't for think you. people understand how much it costs to build these damn things yeah. now. No, yeah. they don't. You know, and th this is a this stat always blows people's minds. It's like the the typical uh, household in the U.S. renting an apartment, a market rate apartment built in the last decade is making $112,000, um, which is obviously a lot of money. And so these brand new apartments being built are not for middle and lower income families. Right. And so you, and that's because of the cost of land, the cost of labor, cost of materials, uh, the regulatory process, regulatory pro fees make up 40% of the cost of development in our country. And so to, in order to get middle and low income housing built, they require subsidies. So that's part of what the Florida bill is accomplishing. It's providing funding and subsidies to make these projects happen. That's that's the first part of it. And then the second part of it is that in some cases, it actually overrides local zoning that has kind of NIMBY tendencies to block out apartments, um, and particularly in commercial and mixed use develop, uh, zoning areas that allows for um, uh, these apartments to get built. And then the third thing it does is that preempts any type of rent control from uh, that, that cities, um, it, it prevents cities from passing rent control bills in their cities. That is awesome. Did you see the stat, both of you, uh, that renting an apartment is $1,175 cheaper than owning a home? Have you seen that stat out there? Yeah, uh, the, that was from, a, there's been a number of studies on this. That one's from the National Multifamily Housing Council, but there's been you know, numerous other studies showing that, that you know, the cost for, everyone talks about the rent, but, you know, we have a, our culture, we tend to celebrate home cost appreciation, because again, we're a pro home ownership society and we tend to boo any kind of rent growth, but you know, home prices have grown a lot more than rents. And then you compound that with the fact that mortgage rates have gone up as much as they have. And it's, uh, you know, far more costly today to be a buyer versus a renter. I'm glad don't you go replacing that. an HVAC either, right? You know, because the minute yeah. you own the house, you're responsible for the HVAC. And and we... is gone, baby. That's right. <laughs> so uh, it's good that you said that over the last three years, the cost of home ownership has gone up 70%. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, everybody, because you think, hey, I'm making money in my home. My home is up 30%, but it costs you 70% more or less. Think about that growth. So my, my question is, isn't there the ability for us in multifamily to say, hey, we've got a, we've got a little bit of a run, runway here. If rates are staying here and cost of home ownership is that high and home prices don't come down because there's not a lot of supply out there, we can still – Consider to be, you know, for the long term, rents can still continue to grow at an, you know, at an above average pace, not 10%, but five or six in all these markets, correct? Yeah, I mean, it's going to depend on the market. I think the, the, the counter, there's a couple of counter factors, right? I mean, number one is that, um, you know, we have uh, some, a lot of noise in the economy right now. And thankfully, job growth continues. I mean, every month you see the headlines in Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, it's like, hey, job growth exceeds economists' expectations. And it's like Groundhog Day every single month. Until yesterday, but, right? <laughs> yeah, but the, uh, there's still that noise out there. And so that's a factor. Um, but also, um, you know, there, there's, particular, there's, there's a lot of, we just talked about supply, and thankfully there is a lot of supply being built right now in, in the Class A luxury space. That's going to be um, doing what it's supposed to do, which is putting downward pressure uh, on pricing there. But, you know, long term, I agree with you. I think that, that um, you know, the affordability story, is one that's grossly misunderstood in our space. I mean, we're seeing that your average market rate renter is paying 23% of their income on rent. And uh, and renters have, have fared very well economically in the last few years, but by and large, with always exceptions. And so, uh, you, you know, I, I I think it's more of a more of a tailwind than a headwind for a uh, majority of households right now. We, um you know, kind of look at things from a uh, perspective of management, uh, purchase price. We call it buy right, manage right, and finance right. And you, you've probably heard the pick two before when you've, you've been dealing with a the vendor. They're like, you can get price, you can get speed, but you're not going to get quality. And we feel like in the multifamily space last year, you're getting one, you're getting debt, right? You could get cheap debt. 
and but you weren't getting priced and the labor market was very challenging. So even managing these things were hard. Uh, we're seeing that the, the labor market ease up. We have our own in-house property management. So that's been getting a little bit easier to hire and retain folks. And we've actually been seeing this, uh, and, and it may be unique to our market that you know we're kind of investing, but we've seen a, a sliver of hope. We're actually getting more deal flow now, and we're, we're, we just connected on a 130-unit deal. We're working on another one right now. So we've seen these mom and pops sort of come out of the woodwork, and they're like, okay, i got to hit the exit button now before it's too late. So we're seeing better pricing right now uh, for our team, and, and we're seeing a little bit better management. But the, the debt is not there. So what, what do you think like the next you know 12 to 24 months looks like? Do you think that becomes a trend or you, you think it's it's just going to tighten up more? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's obviously a big question. And I'll tell you that, you know, forecasting rates has proven to be a fool's errand these last few years. But no kidding. Uh, I want it to go down, though, because we're, we're in like our repositioning phase right now. So if we can reposition these, then get, get out at four and a half, we're going to be looking pretty. But that's that's the what if right there. Yeah, every 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 investor wants rates to go down. You know, the Fed came out a few weeks ago and basically said, don't bank on that this year. And uh, <laughs> you know, in their view, you know, they, they, they're the, the, the data they put out uh, shows that happening next year. And then, um, you know, so I, I think, you know, ultimately, Which is okay too. it's not the end of the world. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think that, you know, I, I'm of the view that the Fed's done a better job than they'll give themselves credit for for already tapering inflation just because the CPI is a challenging a job. It's a, it's a hard spot to be in right now. Right. Because yeah. you get you get people screaming at you. I'm going to go back to Elizabeth Warren freaking out. You're, you're killing, you know, jobs and everything. But uh, I'm not hating on Elizabeth Warren. Yes, I am. But honestly, like, you get you get a lot of pressure from a lot of places right now. But Look, how are you going to slow the, this uh, this runaway inflation down? You got to raise rates. I, I don't see another lever to pull there. You know, the thing about inflation is measured by CPI. A third of CPI is is, is housing, and what most people don't realize is housing is almost entirely measured by rents. And the rent survey they use is lagged by twelve months from what's actually happening. And yeah, it's still showing peak rent growth that's happening that all of us in the industry know actually happened in two thousand twenty one, early twenty twenty two. Yeah, and so it's only a matter of time before CPI uh, shows what all of us know is already happening. Yeah, um, I agree And then that. I think it puts more, um, it gives the, gives the, gives the Fed uh, an excuse to start you know, backing off. It takes off. time to work through, uh, and it's not going to happen overnight. So I, I think we're all feeling that, like boots on the ground. You know, we're seeing uh, rent concessions right now in our portfolio. Yeah. Not, not crazy, but, you know, $100, you know, off what we were getting probably at the end of last year. So one challenge, and I've been warning investors about this, is that if you're – getting into a deal right now and they connected at a high rate at the end of last year, say, you know, 1500 bucks, but they haven't done that in all of 2023, but they're telling you to write your pro forma based on those rents. There's, there's issues there because they may be high and you could be getting yourself into trouble. So I think that's one of the things for folks to watch out for, because I do think you hit a, a, a peak rent growth at the end of 22 and it's, it's calmed down a little bit, still much higher than it was historically, but I, I think it is going to be cooling a little bit. Is that what you're seeing as well? Oh yeah, no, it's definitely cooled off. I mean, la, la, a year ago we were right around 15% year over year rent growth for the new lease rents. Uh, as of March, uh, one year later, we're at 3.9%. Um, and so, and now what's happening is the renewals are catching up because, you know, there's, you know, a lot of investors in value add, they talk about the that's the, the that's the key right there. That's what I'm telling my team is that we're going to see our increase this year if we can connect on our renewals, right? Yeah. The renewal increases are going to cool. Um, yeah. you know, these investors last few years have been banking on high loss to lease. They go in and see big trade outs on the rent side and immediately drive value. That's not happening anymore. You're the, the loss to lease, the gap between the new leases and the in-place rents, uh, you know, we're back around a three to 4% range, which means that you can't push rents on renewal nearly as much as we did in the past without being in a gain to lease situation, which means that you're offering a renter on a renewal more than someone come in the front door. So um, it's already happening. It's just not showing up in CPI yet, but it will. So yeah. you, you talk about renter turnover also. Renter turnover is going yeah. up as well, correct? Because now they can go out, they can rent an old apartment, they yeah. can go buy a house. Negotiating correct? power now, yeah. Yeah, no. So last couple of years, people – so you go back to 2020. Uh, people didn't move because they were scared. You know, the pandemic, right? And so retention went up. Then you get in 21 and 22 – all of a sudden there's no vacancy. And so you look around and you don't have a lot of options. When you did have options, you realized, oh my gosh, my best deal is to stay put. Homeownership's expensive, moving to rent somewhere else is expensive. And I don't like the 8% renewal offer I just got, but it's a heck of a lot cheaper than moving somewhere else. And now you get into 2022 and the balance of power is completely shifted. Vacancy is back up to 5.3%, and so which is a normal level. And so renters are looking around and there's deals out there. There's better deals. And so there is. 
we're finally kind of seeing an opportunity for people to move around more. And so turnover is going to pick up this year. Jay, you wrote an article about building and, and the problem that there was so many delays during COVID supply chain crisis. Do you see a lot of apartments coming online all at once right now, as far as like this next six to 12 months in some of these big markets like Phoenix and Dallas? And do you see that having, having downward pressure on pricing and as far as concessions go as well? Yes. So uh, that, that is probably the hottest topic right now from the you know supply demand standpoint uh, obviously capital markets have the, it, it's all about the, the cost of debt but uh, completions lease ups uh, really from the second half of this year through 2024 are going to be the biggest levels we've seen in 50 years and it's not you know it's Dallas and Phoenix ones that make the headlines but it's happening also in Seattle and Los Angeles and New York and Boise and Provo and and uh, and and Huntsville Alabama I mean it's all over the place and um, it's primarily, though, competing at these very high income rent levels and rent renter levels. And so, but it's the lease up that can, that can affect everybody because a lot of these places will lease up very low and then they'll, they'll jack them after the first year once they get filled. So I think that first year sends ripples through the local economy, no? It has in the past, but my, my view is that it won't as much this time, this cycle. And the reason is that the gap in rents is just so significant. Like today's lease up. Is, is on average uh, anywhere from 25 to 40 percent cheaper than a Class B apartment in most markets. So you'd have to have a four month concession to bring your rents on par. So you're going to have some impact, mm -hmm. but I think you're mostly competing for the top 20 percent of renters uh, for these for, for these lease ups, even with generous concessions. Mm. Wow. OK, I, I, was, I was just curious. So you've been in the industry for quite some time now. What are some of the, the traits of the folks that, and, and when I say folks, the, the investors that have been in for the long haul and continually win and they're continually successful, what are the traits that you see are common amongst the, that group of people? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I think the way I describe it is that it's a disciplined approach, but not a herd mentality approach where, you know, you know, you have to have conviction over your, over your thesis, but you know, there's so much kind of follow the leader stuff in our industry. And, and for a while, like in the institutional space, it was, okay, you got to be in coastal markets. You got to be class A plus in downtowns. And, and of course, we've seen over the last 10 years that really wasn't the best strategy. And, and so, you know, where we've seen more success is oftentimes the stuff that doesn't look quite as good on the cover of an investment committee packet. It's more like your class B Sunbelt suburban stuff. Um, and those who have been in that space have done really, really well. And they got ahead of the curve. Now everyone's talking about it. But those who've been, I think, most successful have been chasing that for a while. So where do you see the opportunity going forward? If you've named all these different, I guess, strategies, techniques, what is it that you're looking for? Because we love the Southeast. That's where we are. We're in, yeah. we're in, we're, we're, we're within three hours of Knoxville. Uh, we love that market. I mean, I love Florida. I live in Florida. But Florida, from an insurance perspective, if they don't get their insurance under control, I mean, with cap rates at three and four, and you're buying these deals with insurance costs at you know, over a thousand a door, if you're lucky, where do you see the opportunity going forward? Yeah, no, Florida, Texas, Southern California are all getting hit really hard by insurance right now, and that's changing the uh, the, the criteria. I mean, those are still great markets from a demand standpoint. Um, you know, now, of course, you also have more liquidity. Um, you know, these aren't just regional buyers in those states anymore. Last, again, 10 years, it, they've become very institutional markets, particularly as more institutions are moving out of the uh, gateway coastal markets. Um, but I think for the reasons you mentioned, like with insurance, I think the other markets you see are becoming – very attractive, both from a demand standpoint, but also a uh, cost standpoint, are markets in the Carolinas. You mentioned Tennessee, um, you know, the mountain states being, in, you know, places like, you know, Salt Lake and Boise has been a hot market of late, got a lot of attention. Um, you know, I could go on, but I, I, I think I think those are pretty safe bets for the next cycle. What, what are you looking for? Obviously, you're looking for growth. You're looking for job growth. Um, from from an investment side, are you, are you also like looking for landlord friendly states when you're evaluating these areas? Like, what what is your t your top criteria for evaluating the market and and where like what places you're really bullish on right now? Yeah, well, there's a correlation between where the people are going, where the business are going, and where it's um and 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 where you know there's there's a there's a there's a friendly environment to be a housing provider, um and a renter for that matter. You know, the, uh, you know, these markets are a lot cheaper than the coastal gateway markets as well. I mean, in fact, there's I, I, there's so many headlines that, oh, you know, it's not cheap to live in Florida and Texas and Arizona anymore. It's gotten too expensive. And that's that's not exactly true. Like affordability is relative. It's still uh, the, the major markets in the less southeast. affordable than it was possibly, but not unaffordable. 
right? Everything's less affordable yeah. than it was, right? So, absolutely. But, the, but you know, relative to living in uh, California, New York, it's still forty to fifty percent cheaper in most of the Southeast and the Southwest, other than Miami, which has gotten really expensive. So, it's uh, and these are still like those long term tailwinds have just not gone away, and that's what you want. At the end of the day, you got you follow the people, and the people, the jobs. They're going to the southeast and the southwest and the mountain states. How do you see immigration playing into this? There's a lot of immigration coming into it. How is that going to affect the markets? Where are these people who are immigrating to the country? Where are they settling down? Well, it's typically been the same spots. I think one change is that, uh, you know, we've had a slowdown in the number of, of, uh, of tech workers uh, coming into the Bay Area of California, given everything that's going on there, but also mm. with visa issues and whatnot. And so that creates, I think, a headwind for Northern California, maybe Seattle to some degree or core Seattle. Uh, but I think it's still a, a positive for, you know, the Texas markets, the Carolinas, the Floridas, the Arizonas, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And Jay, I, I guess the last question for you, I think it's really important for anybody out there who's syndicating deals. How has it been you speaking to people in the industry for people trying to raise capital for these deals? Is it been more yeah. difficult? Cause a lot of people out there may not be having capital calls. They may have started, they may have stopped, distributions what are you hearing out there well it's a couple of things i think you know what i've obviously every situation is different i think that what i the, the theme i hear a lot is that you know this is a time when you know relationships matter for the established <laughs> companies that have those relationships and have the investors who are buying into the long-term story you're probably going to be fine but you do have to raise additional equity because your loan to value ratios are going yes. down you got to cover that gap you know, it's a much tougher time to be entering the market for the first time and trying to build out a story. Like this is what this is, these are these are the times when you want to have a track record and those relationships already in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that. I completely agree. It's uh, it's interesting because if you look back in 2021 and, and 2022, everyone was flush with cash, so a lot of uh, syndicators were given large sums of money to go out and buy deals brought the prices up and now they've pulled back and, and now the guys like Gino and myself are, are re-entering and re-emerging saying, G give me some of that, right? Give me, give me some value. So we're seeing how it goes. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I think it's great. Any any other final thoughts for the folks out there? Any issues you see over the next 12 to 24 months? Anything folk, you know, investors should watch out for? Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, there's gonna be a lot of noise over the next couple of next couple of years, right? You got, you got cooling inflation, you got everything going with rates, you got all this construction, you're going to hear a lot of noise. But you know, I, I think this is a time when, you know, you have to look, take a step back and look at the long game, play the long game and see, you know, is this an investment class or what are you, what are your options for the investment class that has the long term story you want? Because as much as, you know, everything it's a is a basic talent. human need, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, housing is a need. Like you could work from anywhere. You can you can uh, buy food from anywhere, shop from anywhere, but you got to have a home. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's always going to be a need for housing. Uh, we make it very difficult to build housing in our country, and we're not going to see this construction wave last forever. Um, and the long-term tailwinds are still very much intact for rental housing. So I would tell investors, look, like, if you're, this is not the time to be on a one-year flip strategy, but if you're looking at a, you know, a mid and long-term hold, you're going you're gonna to be fine. Love that. Gino, final words. I would say, Jay, I mean, 14 years ago, starting as a researcher in multifamily, he's like, I am never, I am not doing this long term. What am I, I doing do, here? This, this is not boring. My gig, you know, and all of a sudden you start looking at the research and you start analyzing numbers. And you start meeting people in the business and you see that the multifamily space is not a huge industry. You start bumping into the same people at these different conferences and you start learning that wow, this is an entrepreneurial venture. It's not just buying assets here. We're, we're, people are building businesses here. We're actually housing people. We don't call them tenants. We call them residents because yeah. these people are actually renting a unit. They're renting a home and you're actually creating memories. And that's what I think most operators have to think of. If you're out there just trying to flip apartments, it's one thing. But you know, when you're vertically integrated like we are, you're, you're actually trying to create an apartment home for somebody. And I think long term, it's great. And I think you must have fallen in love with the business like Jake and I did, where this is static. This is different. There's market cycles. There's different strategies you need to learn. There's so many different people you can affect and you can impact. And oh, by the way, you can create a lot of wealth in this business. So I just want to thank you for being on. It's been a great show. I've enjoyed this. No, I've enjoyed it a lot. And I agree with you. And also, too, is this is an industry that's still very inefficient, which means there's opportunity. Yes. And I love that from a researcher perspective as well. There's a lot of myths that are, you know, there's good data to challenge those things and obviously opportunities for investment as well. 100 percent. All right, gang, as always, we believe in buying deals for the long term. Think in decades. I'm Jake. He's the G-Daddy. and We make it happen. We'll see you next time.